A reading from the book of the prophet Nehemiah. Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, which consisted of men, women, and those children old enough to understand. Standing at one end of the open place, there was before the water gate. He read out the book from the daybreak till midday, in the presence of the men, the women, and those children old enough to understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra, the scribe, stood on the wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. He opened the scroll so that all the people might see it, for he was standing higher up than any of the people. And as he opened it, all the people rose. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people, their hands raised high, answered, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and prostrated themselves before the Lord, their faces to the ground. Ezra read plainly from the book of the law of God, interpreting it so that all could understand what was read. Then Nehemiah, that is, his excellency, and Ezra, the priest scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people, said to all the people, Today is holy to the Lord your God. Do not be sad and do not weep. For all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. He said further, Go, eat rich foods and drink sweet drinks, and allot portions to those who had nothing prepared, for today is holy to our God. Do not be sanded this day, for rejoicing in the Lord must be your strength. Verbum Domini. of my heart we 
A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, as a body is one though it has many parts, and all the parts of the body, though many, are one body, so also Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and we were all given to drink of one spirit. Now the body is not a single part, but many. If a foot shall say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it does not for this reason belong any less to the body. Or if an ear shall say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it does not follow for this reason that any, they belong any, any less to the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God placed the parts, each one of them, in the body as he intended. If there were all one part, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, nor again the head to the feet, I do not need you. Indeed, the part of the body that seem to be weaker are all the more necessary and those parts of the body that we consider less honorable, we surround with greater honor, and our less presentable parts are treated with greater propriety, whereas our more presentable parts do not need these. But God has so constructed the body as to give greater honor to a part that is with it so there may be no division in the body, but the parts may have the same concern for one another. If one part suffers, all the parts suffers with it. If one part is honored, all the parts share its joy. Now you are Christ's body and individually parts of it. Some people God has designated in the church to be first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then mighty deeds, then gift of healing, assistance, administration, and varieties of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work mighty deeds, do all have gift of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret. Verbum Domini.
sent me to bring good news to the poor and free it on to a Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as those who were eyewitnesses from the beginning and ministers of the word have handed them down to us. I too have decided, after investigating everything accurately anew, to write it down in an orderly sequence for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may realize the certainty of the teachings you have received. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news of him spread throughout the whole region. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by all. He came to Nazareth where he had grown up and went according to his custom into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled this scroll and found the passage where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Rolling up this scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue looked intently at him. He said to them, today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. Verbum Domini. <laughs> Among the many contributions of St. Paul to our system of belief, there are two great themes which dominate the writings of St. Paul and aid us in understanding ourselves as believers and our union with God. And those two uh, themes are really a spirituality and a theology that we receive from St. Paul is the centrality of Christ crucified and our incorporation as members into the body of Christ. So we know uh, that it is through the preaching of the gospel that we are brought to the light of faith. And so we have ears to hear, and the gospel is preached and we come to believe. And we profess this belief, this faith in Jesus Christ as the living Son of God, and then are baptized. And in baptism, we are made shares or participants and imitators of the dying and rising of Christ. We die with him so that we may live with him in his life of grace, that we may reign with him. And we're taught from little on that one of the effects of baptism is that we are incorporated or grafted onto the body of Christ. We are made members of Christ's mystical body, the church. And as such, in Christ, we become adopted children of God. This is what's contained in what we heard in the uh, second reading from St. Paul. And this is what the church, guided by the Holy Spirit, draws from that teaching. And really, he's not teaching us something of his own making, but something he received 
from Christ himself. We just observe the uh, great feast of the conversion of St. Paul. And notice what happened as he came through this same process of faith. He encountered this brilliant light and the Lord spoke to him. He received the light of truth, the light of the gospel. And in that light, what did St. Paul behold but the crucified Christ in glory? This is what many saints will speak of when they have a mystical encounter. This is what St. Francis encountered on Mount Laverna when he received the stigmata. This tremendous light, something so beautiful to behold, he was seeing God, and yet God manifested himself as he does to each of us in the person of Jesus, and Jesus in glory, but as one who was crucified. And Jesus said in glory, in this light, to St. Paul, why do you persecute me? And Paul recognizes in that what we hear in the teaching of the second reading today, that we are all members of Christ's body. And not one of us, uh, we can't excuse ourselves by saying, well, I don't have this gift, and so I'm not a member of the body like you are. Or I'm not an ear, and I'm not a foot, or I'm a foot, not a hand. I'm an ear, not an eye, so I'm less important. I have less to contribute. And this is not an excuse for a believer. The Lord has a purpose for each one of us. And he's called us into his service. And we are to make ourselves or put ourselves at his disposal no matter what it is, using the gifts that he has given us for his end. To have the gospel preached so that all men may experience conversion. So that all mankind may come into that light. So that all men, women, and children will know Jesus Christ. And in that knowledge of Christ, be incorporated into Christ and as members of Christ's body then participate in the life of grace and the reign of Christ for all eternity in heaven. It is in Christ that we know our Heavenly Father, that we become heirs to the kingdom of our Father. And so St. Paul clings to what he saw at that moment of his conversion or to the one whom he encountered, he clings to Christ crucified. Doesn't he say, I glory in nothing but the cross of Jesus Christ? And through it, I am crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to me. That this means nothing but only Christ. Christ is the, the meaning of my life, and so he cleaves to him. Mother Teresa loved to use that word that we cleave to Christ. There, we can't get closer to him. We can't be more intimate to him because we are clinging so tightly to him. I would say as a believer, we should almost suffocate Christ because we hold on to him so tightly. And this is what St. Paul rejoiced in. To be, he rejoiced in being one with the Lord in all of his suffering in all of his rejection, in his arrests, his imprisonments, his beatings. So much so that what would he say? He completes in his life the sufferings of Christ because he was living the very life of Christ. He was this part of this body of Christ who still lives. And what would St. Paul also say? It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so, as we live our Christian faith, what we recognize is, yes, by baptism, I am incorporated into being a member of Christ's body. But in the sacraments of initiation, I receive uh, the gift of the Spirit in confirmation, or am strengthened in the gift of the Spirit in confirmation. 
and that is completed in my reception of Christ in Holy Communion. And so how does the believer really cling to Christ crucified? How is it that we truly cleave to him but by receiving his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist? Now this is the greatest intimacy that we can have with the Lord until we are united with him perfectly in heaven. It is through our reception of the Holy, of Holy Communion that we have that union with him, that we're strengthened in our membership uh, and our participation in Christ's body. And so we're transformed more and more into him that, like St. Paul, we can say, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me that we're so perfectly united with the Lord in Holy Communion that people fail, they no longer see us, but they see and encounter only Christ. This is the life of the saint. And that as we walk as the body of Christ in this world, we are animated by the life and the power of the Holy Spirit. In the mission that the Father sends forth, that uh, he can make, Christ comes forth from the Father, the Spirit comes forth and sent by the Son, and we are participants in that. If we just look at the, the prayers that we say in the second and third Eucharistic prayer, there's always this link between the work of Christ and Christ's body and the work of the Holy Spirit, because they're one. Why? Because God is one. The Son and the Spirit carry out the same will of the Father. We say in the second Eucharistic prayer, humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. So we are made one by our reception of the same body of Christ, and we are made one by the working of the same Holy Spirit who is in each one of us. And we pray too in the third Eucharistic prayer, Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your church and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit with Christ. And so we want to be perfectly united with Christ in his body, and in his spirit. And in that union with God, affected by our reception of communion and the gift of the spirit, we are made one then with the Father. And this is what uh, the Trinity affects, this life of grace that is put into us in our baptism. This perfect union with God. This is what we long for. This is what we desire. But then notice how Mass ends. We always tell you to go. It's always this big word there, especially in the new translation, that word is always first. Now most of you think that means, thank God, Father is finally shut up, it's over with, we can get out of here. That's not what the church is saying. This is a command of Christ. Just like he gave to his disciples, before he ascended into heaven. As he ascended to the Father, he gave them this command and said, go, now you've received me, you're part of my body, you've, you're going to receive the gift of the Spirit, and now go into the whole world and preach the gospel. And do what? Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, so that all men may come to the same knowledge of the Father through me and through the Spirit. And so this is the, uh, the body at work in the church animated by the Spirit that we hear in the Gospel. When Jesus rolls up that, or well, opens the scroll and reads this passage from Isaiah, and then he says, today this passage is fulfilled in your hearing because it's the action of Christ in his own life on earth but then that same mission, that same work of Christ continues in his body, the mystical body, the church. 
And so we look at that and say, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. The spirit of the Lord is upon each one of us. The spirit of the Lord is upon his church, his body, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. And so when we receive that command from Christ at the end of Mass, go, go forth. So we we go, we walk outside, and then we say, now what do I do? And we have it right here in the scripture readings today. Christ says, we'll start acting like my body. One of you is an apostle. One of you is a prophet. One of you has these powerful gifts. One of you teaches. One of you preaches. One of you heals whatever way the Lord chooses to work through you. Be an eye, be an ear, be a hand, be a foot, be a heart. St. Therese, the little flower, really fathomed. She, She loved the idea of missionaries who would go forth into the whole world. And there she was in this cloister, and she thought, well, where do I fit in the body of Christ? And she recognized By God's prompting, she was the heart. She was part of the heart of Christ. That she was there uh, with this great fervor and this great love. And that would animate the work of the church in the world. Every one of us is to participate in that body of Christ and in the work of Christ. And what is the work that we do? What Jesus says that he came to fulfill. Glad to bring glad tidings to the poor, proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind. So I'd simply close in looking at those. The church does bring glad tidings to the poor. On a very practical level, what do we do? Or what can I do in these ways? Am I able, do I have the gift that the Lord has given me? Am I one who is to feed the hungry? to give drink to the thirsty, to clothe the naked, or to shelter the homeless. Then you look at that from a spiritual perspective, and we just, we recognize the spiritual poverty, the depravity of our age. And it was the Lord asking me to be a one who works to enrich others by bringing the light of faith the richness of grace to them. We can be very poor people in this world and yet be so happy and so filled with the richness of the knowledge of God. To proclaim liberty to the captives. There are those who have converted to Christianity in our world and are imprisoned. We may not be able to go and take the key and unlock the door and get them out, but we can certainly work to do that. So many of our Christian brothers and sisters are enduring tremendous misunderstanding and enduring horrendous persecution at the hands of radical uh, Islamic uh, activity. Do we pray for them that the Lord is able to bring them freedom? We, do we recognize that there are those in captivity because of the gospel? And then our own brothers and sisters, our husbands, our wives, our children, enduring the spiritual captivity of this age, the chains of addiction, of pornography, or the unforgiveness that we so often carry about in our hearts, the resentments that each of us has. Can we be an instrument to proclaim liberty to the captive? Sometimes we need from a brother or sister that word to say, you know, Father, you got to let that resentment go. You really are carrying around some deep unforgiveness for someone. Why are you holding yourself bound? Why are you holding that other person bound? Move on in your life. Ask for the Spirit to set you free. To bring recovery of sight to the blind. 
or to a world that has lost sight of God, can we be those instruments, those hands and feet to help reveal the face of Christ? Can we bring others to light? And then Jesus says that he uh, came to let the oppressed go free. So many are burdened by loneliness, by age, by sickness. Can we bring the freedom that hope brings with it? By paying a visit, can I go to these individuals and spend time? This is one of the greatest things a Christian can do in today's world because none of us has enough time. We don't have enough time for our husband or for our wife. We don't have enough time for our children because we're too busy updating our Facebook page, texting a friend, or reading the whatever's, listening to whatever is on television. But can I put that aside a half hour earlier in a day to give my family time because they feel oppressed, they feel burdened because no one listens and no one cares. Sometimes this is the greatest thing that we can do. To visit someone who is aged or who is lonely, they cling to you. They haven't seen someone in a long time. I just read yesterday about a Franciscan brother who has spent, just celebrated recently, 60 years of service in religious life. He's a Franciscan friar of the Holy Land, Brother Roger. And in one of the assignments that he had, he was on Uh, Mount Nebo, I think, in the Holy Land, and he said he was there all alone so often. And he listened to this howling wind. Now, many of us who make make a day visit there, if God ever allows us to go on pilgrimage, we say, oh, isn't this profound, this encounter with God? And I think this brother would probably say, okay, we'll try spending the next three years here (laughs) every day and you get lonely hearing this voice of God in the wind. And he said, sometimes I would just turn on the radio so I could hear another person's voice. Isn't this how an elderly person might feel? That they just want to talk to someone. Am I a member of the body of Christ who uh, is one who can maybe spend that time visiting one person in my parish community and helping that lift that burden or that oppression. What about the person who's been diagnosed with cancer, a young person who lives in fear for their children? What is God asking of them? Who will take care of my little ones? This is a burden that oppresses. What this individual does not need is someone to come along and say, here, here's the homeopathic remedy to heal all of this. If you just do this, it'll take it away. They say, I don't want to hear that. They want to have somebody who says, I can't do anything for you, but I love you, I will pray for you, Whatever you need, let me know. If I can bring you a meal, if I can run the vacuum in your home, if I can take care of your children, I can't tell you it's going to be okay, but I can tell you that God loves us and that God will care for us and that God will provide for us in the burden that we feel this day. This is what it means to be a member of the body of Christ. So united to the Lord that we have the same love, the same charity, the same care that he has for every person in this world. Knowing that each man, each woman, each child needs to know him, needs to know Christ so that we can know the Father and to avail ourselves to be animated by that power of the Holy Spirit 
so that as we receive Holy Communion and we're sent out and told to go forth, that we can do this, that we can continue as members of Christ's body to fulfill what has been pronounced in our hearing.